Revelation 19 is the hallelujah chorus. That's the godly will look back and celebrate that God has finally judged. Now, some of you have got to be sitting there going, well, well that doesn't sound very Christian. These people get judged and, and God is going to celebrate that. Think of it this way. Every person who's been cheated, every person who's been defamed, every rape, every child that has been molested, every, every person who has felt pain and never had that justice resolved will see God resolve all of it. He will say, enough, it's over. Now we will have righteousness. Go to Revelation at the very beginning, chapter 1. Put a box around verse 19. That's the outline of the book. Write the things which you have seen. Put a little Roman numeral 1 next to that one. Then write the things which are. Put a little Roman numeral 2 above that one. And the things which will take place after these things. Put a little 3 after that one. So there's a three-part outline, okay? Now, if he says, write the things that you have seen, that's past tense, right? So, that means verses 1 through 18 of chapter 1, he already saw before he got to 19. Is everybody with me? So, chapter 1 really is what he's seen. What's in chapter 1? The majority of it is a vision of the risen Christ. So, when he sees Jesus, John doesn't go running up and go, Jesus, it's been a long time. He falls at his feet like he's a dead man stunned by the brilliance and magnificence of Jesus exalted. Okay, that's chapter 1. Go to chapter 2, verse 1, and put above chapter 2, verse 1, number 2, things that are. And that's in chapters 2 and 3. Things that are. And what I mean by are are seven churches and letters to them. In other words, at the time that John is receiving this revelation, there are seven churches, and the order of the seven churches is the order of the old postal route. So they're given in that order. Okay? So in chapter 2, verse 1, circle Ephesus. In chapter 2, verse 8, circle Smyrna. In chapter 2, verse 12, circle Pergamum. In chapter 2, verse 18, circle Thyatira. Thyatira, Thyatira. These are four cities that have four churches that existed at the time. They are part of the things which are at that time. Okay? Go to chapter 3. Circle in chapter 3, verse 1, Sardis. Then in chapter 3, verse 7, circle Philadelphia. And finally, in chapter 3, verse 14, Laodicea. The way I remember them is, everybody sing, please, that sa sounds pretty lovely. Everybody sing, please, that sounds pretty lovely. Or, everybody's Ephesus, Smyrna, sing, Pergamum, please, Thyatira, that sounds Sardis, Pretty Philadelphia, lovely Laodicea. That's how I remember it. Okay? I'm not telling you it's brilliant. I'm telling you it's how I remember it. But that's the seven in that order. You can learn them. They're not, it's not that hard. Now, what are those? These are seven letters to seven churches that existed at the time of John, things that are right now when John is hearing it from Jesus. And indictments or instructions based on things that they had done and how Jesus was going to judge them. You with me so far? Everybody crystal clear on where we're at? Okay, I want you to go to 119 again, and I want you to see, see something that is in English not translated well, but in 119, do you see the term after these things at the end of 119? The things which will say, take place after these things. I want you to write two words in the margin, in Greek, meta tauta. It means after the things which are. The third section is after the things which are. So it's replaced in, in 119, it's, it's translated in my text 
these things which will take place after these things. But it's actually the things which will take place meta talta, after the things which are. And you're asking me, why is that important? Because I want you now to go to chapter 4, verse 1. Now look at the first three words. Because in Greek, the first three, first three words are actually two words, meta talta, after the things which are. Now, why am I telling you that? Because the third section, beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, is the beginning of everything that happens after the church age. So he says, let me tell you about the church age, seven churches that are in the church age, and he just get, he, he puts these seven churches in here. They are literal churches from the time of John. Churches he could visit and go to and have Sunday school and sing a hymn. After that, though, he says, there's going to be an event. And that's going to be everything from chapter 4 onward. Revelation 4 to 22 will be after the things of the church age. Does that make sense? Revelation does more clearly what Isaiah does in kind of smoke and mirrors. In chapter 4 and 5 of Revelation, I want you to see that 4 doesn't start off on the earth. It starts off in heaven. 4 and 5 is a scene in heaven. After the church age, what's the next event that happens? Well, I'd probably go to 4.1 and say, after these things, the next thing that happened was a door was opened in heaven. The next thing that's going to happen is heaven's going to open its door. A trumpet is going to sound. And he's going to hear, come up here. So when I tell you right next to verse 1, right next to that, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, when I tell you that at the end of the church age, the dead in Christ rise first, and we which are alive and remain are caught up together with him in the air from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. In this text, it says, heaven opens a door, blows a trumpet, and says, come on up here. That's the description of the coming up. Okay? And so what he's telling you is, at the end of this, the next thing that happens is, he says, get up here, and we go up. And what happens? In 4 and 5, there is a <gasps> beautiful throne room scene. God the Father is on the throne. There's a crystal sea around it. The heavens are filled with people who have known Jesus from every people and nation and kindred and tribe and tongue. They are gathered together. There's the one sitting on the throne who is the father of all. And we are just gasping at what we see. And interestingly enough, the lamb is not sitting on the throne. He's down with the people. He's walking with them. And all of a sudden, in front of this crystal sea are seven spirits of God. Remember those? So now I've got the Father there and the seven spirits of God. And I see them again in, in chapter 4, verse uh, 5. And there's thunder and lightning. And, and there's a sea of, grass, uh, of glass like crystal. And there's four living creatures with eyes all over them moving around. And we're just, we're stunned at the beauty of this thing. And this is the song of heaven. And it's in 4, 4, 8. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And here's the thing, everybody stops in heaven. There's all this marvelous praise. And at the end of chapter four, there's a question that comes up. There's a problem. The problem is that people are waiting to see who's worthy to advance the story past where it is. And it's interesting. It says in verse 10 of chapter 4 that the, four to, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne. Remember I told you what happens when we first get there is a judgment where our things are brought forward and then we get to put them in front of him. This is an expression of this. We're going to give him the work of our hands. Our lives are going to be yielded. Lord, this is everything I have and everything I've done. It's now all yours. And God draws together all those things that were done through the power of his spirit for his honor and glory. And then it says in 4.11, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and power and for for you created all things, and because you of you they are existed and were created. 
And then what happens is someone hands a scroll. Someone, it says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on, on the throne a scroll. And it was wound up like this, like scrolls are. And someone cries out, who is able to open the scroll? The scroll is human history. Who can move the story forward? What do we do now? We've, we've gotten all the way to here. We're in heaven. We're looking at his glory. Who can move the story? Who is worthy to bring down on the people those judgments? Who's worthy to judge the earth? That's the question. And out of, the, out of the crowd begins, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. And the one who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, from the root of David, comes. And this is sealed with seven seals. Now, it's not seven seals like this. It's not seven. It's seven like you open a little bit and there's a seal. You open a little bit more and there's another seal. And then you open a little bit more and there's another seal. And you open a little bit more and there's another seal. In other words, ancient documents used to come with seals in it where I have something very, very secret I want Luke to have. So I write that on the inside. Then I seal that with a seal that says for Luke. But I have other stuff that I don't mind that if, other, that, that if Luke sees this. So I'm going to say to Abby. Now, that means Luke could read what Abby has, but Abby can't read what Luke has. And then I could say, well, I, I've got something. I don't mind if, if, if Abby and Luke both read it, but I'm going to say to Ashley. And then I'm going to move this forward. I'm going to say to Andrea. And each time I'm going to seal it. But it, what it means is the most precious part is the last part because that's the part for Luke. Does that make sense? What happens in chapter 5 is Jesus basically comes and opens it. But every time he opens a seal, judgment goes out of that seal and hits the earth and pummels it. So in chapter 6, it's the beginning of what are called the seal judgments. They're Jesus opening a scroll, and as he breaks the next thing, judgment comes. As he breaks it a little further, judgment comes. What he's doing is literally sending the judgments on the earth. That's in chapter 6. We're going to study them. I'm just trying to put some context to it. Right in the middle of the story, chapter 6 has opening one seal after another. One seal after another. And by the time you get down to the sixth seal, there are seven of them, but you get to the sixth seal, and it goes, judgment, 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 stop! Chapter 7 says, stop the judgment. There's 144,000 people that I have recruited. They're all Jews. I know that because they come from various tribes, and they're named. They're all Jews, and I'm going to spread them into the earth. Don't touch them. Let them go out during this period of the tribulation and share the gospel. And the gospel isn't only that Jesus came and paid for your sin, but that he also came back and took his church, and that he's also coming back at the end of this tribulation, and he will save us. That's the gospel. It's your track plus an extra page, okay? And ultimately, during this time, 144,000 Jews are out there in the world bringing the gospel. Now, did you ever see these... Um, fireworks on 4th of July where they shoot it up and it goes boom and it's like this and, but one part goes off and opens up again and one part goes off and opens up again okay six seals poof, broke open the seventh seal is actually the beginning of the trumpets so the seven trumpets come from the seventh seal does that make sense so the six seals are independent judgments. The seventh one actually opens up into another seven. The six trumpets are actually judgments. The seventh trumpet opens up into another seven. Does that make sense? So there's three rounds of judgment. All I want you to mark in your Bible at this point is in chapter six are seals. And in chapter seven, it's kind of a play on words. It's sealed people. It's people with a seal over them that you can't harm them. No demonic, no governmental, no martyrdom of those 144,000. They have a job to do, and God instructs that they are to be left to do that job in chapter 7. In chapter 14, they're going to lose that seal, and they're going to start dying in, as martyrs. But for a time, they get to go out, and they get to do their job. So if 6 is seals, 7 is sealed people, 
Eight is the beginning of the trumpet judgments. All I want you to do is put in chapter six this fraction. One quarter. You will find that one quarter of the earth's surface and one quarter of the earth's people are killed in the first round of judgment. In chapter six. In chapter eight, the second round of judgment is in chapters eight and nine. Your fraction for chapters eight and nine, one third. It's one third of all the remaining ones. And that is the trumpets of chapters eight and nine. And when you're reading eight and nine, all of a sudden, by the end of nine, listen to chapter nine, verse 20. Listen to the sound of this. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the work of their hands so as to not worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders and their sorceries, nor of their immorality or their thefts. Right next to the word sorceries, pharmakia, drugs. The word sorceries is pharmakia. They wouldn't give up their drugs. So God characterizes the tribulation as a period of idolatry, as a period of drug use, as a period of rampant immorality. You just can't even imagine that that could happen, can you? And as we draw later and later in the program, watch and see what you see in the news and, and Understand, this isn't even hard. A hundred years ago, this was hard to preach. Now it's like, well, duh, of course that's what it'll become. A hundred years ago, how would you stand up and say, the whole world will see this? Now you just go, C and N. It's getting easier to understand the later it's getting in the program. Now in chapter 10, I want you to understand something. In chapter 10, he, um, he starts to... to hear some things that are going on in heaven, and he's sickened by the weight of what he has to do. So in 10, all I want you to write next to chapter 10 is recommissioning John. Recommissioning John. You know why? He gets sick. He doesn't want to tell you the rest of the story. He says, I am done. This is so sickening, I cannot tell you the rest of this story. And the angel says, eat this. And then he says, at the end of nine, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. It's not up to you. I need you to open your mouth and go tell me the rest of the story. I don't want to tell the rest of the story. Eat this book. Tell the rest of the story. Now, in chapter 11, he starts to tell you a story about two very unique people from the Bible who come back for a second run for a sequel long after they've been gone. One of them comes up controlling the weather. What prophet is known as a weather controller? Elijah. The other one was known as the great law giver, Moses. And that's why Elijah and Moses' body become important. Elijah's taken up in a whirlwind and Moses' body was fought over between angels and demons in the New Testament. They fought over his body. Why? Because God needed to use it again. But you have in chapter 11, two that come back. And they come back, what's that? Where is it now? Where is it now? I don't know. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't say it out loud. Whatever God has planned for it, what he's saying is these two guys come back and, the, and who recognizes them by the sound of their voice? What people on earth would recognize Elijah and Moses? Jews, and they start flocking back to God. Now, in chapter 11, they're not only flocking back to God, but here's what happens. The enemy of God kills them on the street in Jerusalem. And they lay there on the street in Jerusalem. And the world declares an international holiday. Ding dong, the witch is dead. And what happens is three and a half days, look at verse nine, for three and a half days, the people and the tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be put in a grave. 
And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate and they will send gifts to one another and call it Christmas because these guys are dead. So every morning, CNN, and now we bring you back alive to Jerusalem. And yes, they're still dead. Send someone a gift today. Isn't this a wonderful day? Tell a florist. 1-800. And that's, how, that's what it says. The world will celebrate because they so hate the word that these two brought of the living God. And they hate the Jewish people. But the Jewish people heard a message that drew them back toward God. Now, they're not all coming, but many. Here's the problem with, the, here's the problem with Jerusalem. It's those three-day death scenarios. Three days later, three and a half days later, the breath of life came into them. You got to hate that. Everybody's got live cameras. You got CNN and talking heads standing there. Yes, we're on the street here and there they are. They're laying right. Oh my goodness, they're getting up. So after three and a half days, it says the breath of life came into them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Yeah, zombies. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, come up here. And up they went. And they're focusing the camera on. Ah! Now, is that strange? Of course it is. I personally think that one of the great reasons the enemy has seeded so much sci-fi is I think what you're going to hear about is all the aliens. I think there'll be a counter story that makes perfect sense in some other way that isn't Bible. Because obviously the Bible can't be true, because if the Bible's true, then there's a God. And if there's a God, there's a morality, and I don't want that. So there must be aliens. <laughs> All I'm trying to get you to see is that this story is told in sequence. You get to the end of 11, and now the seventh trumpet is unfolded. Now, remember what I told you about the seventh judgment? Six trumpets break, and the seventh one becomes the next set of judgments. But it's interesting the seventh angel sounded, there were loud voices in heaven. <coughs> Look at what heaven is doing while the earth is getting pummeled. Where are you? Heaven, listen to the song you're singing. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell their faces down and worshiped God and said, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are, who were, because you have taken your great power and you've begun your reign. In other words, there's a kingdom coming soon. We can feel it already. It's on its way. And what we're doing is we're up there excited. Now in chapter 12, he goes back to Heaven Vision, HNN, the other network. He goes back to Heaven Vision to tell you the story of a woman. I keep telling you through the Bible that the Bible's about these two marriages. I'm stealing all my material from the, the text, okay? Trust me, I, I didn't make up any of it. In 12, there's a story of a woman who had a head with a crown of 12 stars. Do it this way. My mom has a locket in which all of the birthstones of all of her children are. Okay. This is a woman who had 12 stars of children. Who is she? She's a nation. And this nation had a child. And that child raised the anger of a dragon who is... A, who is a great red drag dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems or ruler crowns. In other words, governments that are demonically backed and Satan himself went after this woman because of her child. Who's the woman? Israel. Who's the child? Jesus. And so he goes back and he, you have to remember that John lived before the Holocaust. John lived before anti-Semitism. John didn't know what was going to happen in the history of the Jewish people, and it hasn't gotten as bad as it's going to get. So he comes back and he talks about this male child in verse 5. Who's the male child? She gave birth to a son, a male child, and he's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Any questions? That's Messiah. And this one who gave us Messiah is this woman. And this woman is being chased and destroyed. The two things that characterize the end times, hatred for Israel and hatred for, for Jesus and all that he stands for.
And if you watch the college campuses, it's not rocket science. It's interesting because in heaven, there's a battle. There's a battle because the enemy of Jesus, Satan himself, has been wrestling with Michael, who is known, you're going to find out when we study Daniel, is known as the archangel guardian over one nation, Israel. So there's been a struggle and a fight. And in chapter 12, verse 13, it says, The dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Satan gets kicked out of heaven in chapter 12. And when he gets to the ground, boy, is he ticked. And he goes right after Israel. And he tries to do what he can. And every time he goes after her, we're going to tell the story later, but every time he tries to go after her, God swallows up. He sends a flood and God swallows it into the ground. He keeps trying to get her and God keeps thwarting what he's doing. So that there's obviously dramatically, poetically told a story where the enemy's trying to crush Israel and God keeps preventing him from doing it. And then what you'll see is in chapters 13 and 14, uh, uh, let me just do chapter 13. In chapter 13, there is a governmental set of beasts. When you see beast, think government. There's a governmental set of beasts that come to swallow Israel and destroy it. Some international United Nations, who knows what they are, but whatever they are, they're coming and they're coming from the land and they're coming from the sea and there are a variety of them and they're coming to pummel him. I don't want to do more than that. Get to chapter 14 and God says, stop. In seven, I told you I'm protecting 144,000. In 14, I'm taking my special seal of protection off of them. Now many of them will die as martyrs. They've had time to get their message out and their message has become effective and thousands upon thousands of Jewish people are being drawn and some non-Jews are being drawn as well. People are hearing the gospel because of these. However, I'm not going to protect their bodies anymore. When I'm done with them, I'll call them home. And what's interesting is there will be then a falling that begins to happen. Look at chapter uh, 14, verse 8. Because you keep seeing this in the, in the prophetic form. It says, another angel said, uh, a, a second one, Fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. All right, think, think prophetically. M immorality, harlotry, what is it a symbol of? What's that? Idolatry. Idolatry or false religion. So this Babylon is a religious system that's caused all kinds of people to fall into false religion and substitute a relationship with the living God for a false one. By, by the time you get to Revelation, it's simple, okay? And the, the last scene that I want you to see is just as he commands them to begin. At the end of chapter 14, he says, all right, put a sickle in it. It's time to harvest. What is harvest? Judgment. It's time to judge. And just before the last final great judgment, just before the wrath of the tribulation is chapter 15, and it's not a scene on, in, on earth, it's a scene in heaven. Meanwhile, back with Zoe and the other ones of her friends in heaven, it says that something was going on. It says, I saw, verse 2, something like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses. What's the song of Moses? Exodus 15. The song of Moses is God has set us free. What they're taught, it's the song of people who have been redeemed. And listen to the song. They sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And this is their song. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come up and worship before you, and your righteous acts have been revealed. In heaven, Zoe's going to be singing, God, you had the right to do everything you're doing in this tribulation, and everything you're doing is absolutely justified and correct. Here's what no one is doing. I object. Nobody's objecting in heaven. You know what heaven doesn't have? A complaint department. Everybody gets there, looks at God and goes, he definitely knows what he's doing. Wow. And in chapter uh, 16, there begin the final bowl judgments. This is the third of three rounds of judgment. What's the first round of judgment called? 
seals. What's the second one called? Trumpets. The third one's called bowls or vials, either one. And what you see in 16 is that these vials of judgment pour out. And I want you to look very closely at something. Verse 16.1, 16, I heard a loud voice from, uh, from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls or vials of wrath. The first angel went, poured his bowl on the earth. It became loathsome and malignant sores on the people who had been marked with the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. The second one poured out into the sea and it became like blood, like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. All living things in the sea died. See, in the first set of judgments, it was one quarter. In the second set of judgments, it was one third. In the third set of judgments, it's every little fish in the sea. They're all dead. By the time this is over, he will have destroyed earth. Then a third angel poured out his, his bowl, and now the rivers and springs of water became blood. And I heard the angels of the water saying, righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judged these things. They poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. You killed all, the, all of my people. You martyred all my people. You get blood. That's what you get. You want blood? I'll pour blood right out on you. Fourth angel poured out in verse 8. Sun, and it scorched men like fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat. What was their response? They blasphemed the name of God who has the power over these plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Everything is being destroyed. You are laying in the hot, dry, blistering sun. Your skin is bubbling up and you are cursing God because they will not give up. You, the arrogance of man is deep. The hatred for God is deep. It says, the fifth angel poured out his bowl, verse 10. They gnawed their tongues because of pain. They bit their tongues to try and get through the pain. And they blasphemed God, God of heaven, because of their pains and their sores. They did not repent. Sixth angel poured it out on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the ways of the kings were prepared. Remember I told you, then they begin to gather and they are upset and they want to kill all the Jewish people. God dries up the obstacles and now they are making their way on beginning to come from the east, from the south, from the north, from the west to converge to crush Israel. Why? Because they are convinced if they can kill the Jews, their problems will be over. I believe they will be convinced that the Jews are in control of them that they're in control of whatever's going on with the weather. If that makes, sounds funny to you, can I just tell you, do you have any idea what technologies you have that came from the Jewish people? You wanna know about the size of the processor that's in your, in your computer? Because that was done in Jerusalem. But that's okay, so is most of the software that runs it. In other words, I believe they're gonna accuse them of manipulating the world stage and weather and say, we've got to kill them to save humanity. It's going to sound logical at the time. It's going to sound reasonable. It's going to sound like they're, they're, they're just trying to kill us all. And then the second half of 16, they will gather all over Israel, but particularly in a place called Armageddon. In Revelation 16, 16, circle the word Har-Mageddon. Har-Mageddon is the mountain of the human destruction of Megiddo. And when you're in Israel, I will point to it and show you what that mountain looks like. Finally, I just want to point out to you, in chapter 17, do you see that the heading for 17 in your Bible is the doom of Babylon? Look in verse 5. Who is Babylon? What are they talking about? What kind of Babylon? 17.5. Babylon's always a symbol of the world, but what, what, what specifically in the world? Harlotry, so it's religious Babylon in 17 that is destroyed. But in 18, it's something different. It's also Babylon, but I want you to go in chapter 18 to verse 11 and 12 and tell me what kind of Babylon that is. What, Babylon equals world system, but it's religious in 17 and 18, it's something else. Economic. Economic. Now it's the merchants, it's the cargoes, it's the... So in other words, all of the religious and economic world system will collapse in 17 and 18. That's the end of the Great Tribulation. 
So by the time we get to 19, look what it says. What is heaven doing? Praise. They're up there singing, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And the second time they, they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. So the beginning of chapter 19 is those of us who are in heaven are celebrating the downfall of the religious and the economic system. Here's what you won't be doing in heaven. You won't be looking down going, oh, don't hurt that, that's my car. You won't care. You will go, it is right that God balance the scales of what they have done in rebellion. Now, at that point, you see in verse seven, let us rejoice and be glad, give glory to the lamb for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now back up to heaven, there's praise going on and now the wedding feast is going to begin. And at the end of chapter, uh, I'm sorry, not the end, for, but from seven to 10, what you have is this, is this uh, wedding feast that's assembling. Now, just about that time back on earth, what's happening? It's the end of the tribulation period. Remember, I left off in the story back on earth with the, the nations gathering to crush Israel. So they're still coming. We're up there singing hallelujah, getting ready for a wedding. And they're getting surrounded and it's getting desperate. Now here it comes, verse 11, I saw heaven opened. Behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him is called faithful and true, and righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. Those are ruler crowns. And he had the name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He has a clo uh, his clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, meaning people who have been judged. People are post-judgment. Because the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Post-judged people are with him on white horses. I am 379,883 rows back, third from the left. That's me. <laughs> Zoe's, you know, oh, never mind. Verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So you know who he is. He comes out. He sees the armies. He speaks and they're finished. It's the most anticlimactic battle ever. Big buildup, quick delivery. And then what happens? In verses 17 and 18, there's a supper for the birds. They descend on the carcasses of the men and commanders and armies of the world that have come to, to sack Israel and have been killed by the one coming from the sky. I saw the beast, verse 19, and the kings of the earth and the armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the throne and against his army. The beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed signs. And, the, uh, and it says, what, what, were, what was done to them at the end of verse 20? They're thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from his mouth, who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Birds descend and pick over bodies that are outlying everywhere. Now, it's at this point in the beginning of 20, we've reached now the king coming. The army has come. He spoke. They're gone. Now what we have is a problem. First of all, we have human carnage all over the, <laughs> the site. So God sends birds to help clean it up. And then it says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and, his great, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. In case you're not sure who he is, he tells you every possible way he can, the description of who this is. And he bound him for how long? Mille annum, millennium, a thousand years, one millennium. He bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years was completed. Are you with me? The thousand-year kingdom begins right there. So we have followed this in order. Have you followed me the order of this? Okay. Because 
when you're reading Isaiah, he's all over the place. John just puts it right in order so you get the whole thing. But by the time you get to the last book of the Bible, you've read all the others. And the point is that they all should make sense to you. That's, I'm jumping the gun because I don't want you to be lost or you're going to be frustrated. I'm telling you that there is an order to these events. I'm not making it up. It's right here. Now, here's the thing. At the end of that, it says, he threw him into the abyss in verse 3. And he says, so they wouldn't deceive the nations. And then I saw thrones in verse 4 and judgment. And I saw souls of those who were beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or their hand. And they came and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So martyrs get a special place during this kingdom. Not every one of us will be elevated to the point that they will be. Why? Because they gave their lives for their testimony. So those who had their lives taken from them, Jesus will restore them as judges above others. And then he says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years was completed. So there are some who do not get up until here. They've died and they won't get up until here. I'll tell you who they are later. Well, I'll tell you who they are now. They're, they're Old Testament saints. David doesn't get up until here. He slept all the way through this. He's with the Lord spiritually, in his spirit. But in his body, the church gets their bodies before the ancient Israelites get theirs. So, like, if I were to die before the, whatever this is, the, before Jesus comes back, I would be in the same spiritual state as David. Yes. However, you'll get a body back faster and get a whole thousand year jump on them on using it. Okay. So, during that thousand year it's not there, but, we will. but we are, and here's the, here's the part that I can't tell you. What are we doing? I don't know. It, the Bible doesn't tell us. It just says that we're following the Lord, but it doesn't tell us what he's got us doing. It, it really doesn't relate that at all. So there's just, there's a gap in what we know. We know we're with him. We know he's got it planned. We know it's all good, but we don't know what it is. Why? Because the Hebrew prophet never even knew about you. And the New Testament was so focused on putting the things that the Hebrew prophet said in some kind of order that you know how it happens, that there's this big gap. There's a silence there. Now, there's all kinds of people who write dissertations on what this is, but the fact is there aren't any verses to tell us. We don't know. So we just know that we're doing something and it's good. You know? Now, keep going because we're not done yet. At that point, it says... Verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are under the four corners of the earth. He makes one last try to fight back. Where is that? That's all the way at the end of the thousand years kingdom. Satan comes back for another run. But here's the thing. It's a non-starter. Um, you know, why, did, why would God allow him to come back one last time? The thousand years allows God to check off for Israel all the things he promised them. But this checks off something he promised the whole world. You do not blame the enemy. The enemy is not at fault here. He was tied up for a thousand years and still some of you wanted to rebel. You cannot blame the law for the righteous lawgiver sits on the throne of Jerusalem and still you want to rebel. In other words, God's just trying to make a point. You want to rebel. Don't blame me. Don't blame the Bible. Don't blame the Satan. This isn't about any of those. This is about you. And it says that, that in verse 8, and, and he will come out to deceive the nations. And verse 9, they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. They're, they're going to come together in the remade area and the fire will come down from heaven and devour them and the devil who has deceived them that devil will be thrown forever and ever into the lake of fire it's game over for the devil so by by chapter 20 verse 10 devil's game over he never comes back now what happens now david gets up it says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it and whose presence the earth and heaven fled away. No place was found for them. This is the final judgment of all, including 
those who, do, who rejected God through their life, and those were thrown into the, the death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the final judgment for the non-believer. So right now if they die, they are separated from God, but they are not in their final state. It's going to be worse after what they're in now. What they're in now is horrible, and all it's going to do is get worse. If you die as a believer, what you're in will be great, but what you're going to get is going to get better. So it's going to be excellent getting even more excellent. For them, it's going to be bad even getting worse. Okay? Chapter 21 is a new heaven and a new earth. And the description in 21.10 is of this city that floats above the earth. It's a great size for Jerusalem that comes down like a cube and sits above the earth. It's a space station. I don't know. It's something. God remakes the heavens, remakes the earth, and puts believers in two different locations. Some are city believers and some are rural believers. And the rural believers farm and bring things in and out of the city, and the city believers have a very special place in God's economy. And they are uh, given those positions based on who they are, and there's a difference between how God handles Jews and non-Jews in that time. Everybody gets something really cool. But what you are determines what you get. And at the end of it in 22, there's a river that flows that offers food, and you eat it. So there is food in heaven. And by the way, this isn't in heaven. It's the final state. It's heavens and earth. It's like what we have now, but not like what we have now. So people that die now, do they go to heaven? You mean believers? Yeah. You're, they're with the Lord where he is, but they're not in their permanent place because they're not bodied yet. So right now, if, if grandma dies, she goes and her spirit is with Jesus. Her body's here. Now she waits for the trumpet to sound to get her body back. The same one? It's not the same one. It's elementally the same. In other words, there's... You're some, there's some relationship between your physical body now and, who you will, and the body you'll have in, in, in the future. God remakes that body, and for some reason, he wants the one you have now to start with. However, the second one, you've got to read in 1 Corinthians to get this, okay? The, the second one is better than the first one because everything, everything about your body that has been inflicted by the sin and fall is gone. So you become Zoe as you would be in Zoe perfection, which is, you know, probably real close to what you are now, but not exactly what you are now, okay? So you see what I'm saying? And, and what's interesting is, you know, I told you there's two judgments, right? There's judgment over sin and judgment over works. But how much of your works are related to your sin? Like, did you not do something right because of your sinfulness? Yes. So these are intertwined. You know, I, I make these nice boxes and you see them real boxy, but a lot of things are intertwined. So I give you first body, second body, but they're actually quite intertwined. There's, there's, we're going to know you and you're going to know you and you're going to know us, but it's not going to be exactly the same. The funny part is people who knew you when you were a baby and haven't seen you since are going to know you too. How's that work? There's, I mean, maybe they have to ask. When, when, you're, when you're in the time after time, what difference does it make if you have to stop and ask somebody? You have 100 million zillion years. What difference does it make? Ask slowly. It's not going to matter. You're not getting older, so, you know. And, and seriously, you don't have a day timer. There's no time, so you don't have to worry about it. All these things at the end of Revelation are told in a way like what we have here and now, but it's not like that. It's that there's no words to tell you what it's like. So he tells you the best he can. So, yes, you have a body, but it's not exactly like this one. Yes, I mean, Jesus is a good example of the resurrected body. He walked through a wall. I can't do that, but he did, and you will too. I'm not sure what the meaning of a wall is, if everybody can walk through one. I'm not really sure what it's for, okay? So, again, when, once you start working into the spiritual um, uh, realities of this, it becomes very hard for us to know what any of the things are. Whenever you're dealing with God, you're dealing with things where he's trying to explain an elemental form, little building blocks of what's real. 
But you know what? We, it is as false, honestly, as us looking at a little toy car and thinking that's like a real one. It's, yeah, it's sort of like a real one, except for it's totally not. This is sort of like what it's going to be like, except for totally not. So trust it. Know that it's accurate. Know that there's no way to accurately tell you what's really going to happen. So this is the best he, he's, he's going to be able to deliver to our small minds. There is a fixed timeline. I'm not making it up. All the prophets f could flow into it, but they didn't understand it. They only understood whatever God told them to say that day or whatever he showed them that day. They didn't know, they didn't know where to put it. Joel didn't know there would be a church age. He just knew there was a shame time coming that would end in a kingdom. That's all he knew. He didn't know what the shame was. He just knew that it, it was God's spirit doing something that would shame his people, that would eventually remove their shame. That's all he knew.